and a half years ago, I received a phone call. On the other line was a deep-voiced man, and he said, we will kill you if you do not stop. Why was I being threatened? Because I had tweeted a hashtag. On April 23rd, 2014, I was sitting in my car listening to a local radio station when a story came on about 276 Nigerian schoolgirls who had been kidnapped from their dorm room in Chibok, Borno State, by the terrorist group Boko Haram. They were put on trucks and driven away. A few had managed to jump off the trucks and escape, but over 219 were missing. The parents had pursued their captors into the Zambesa forest but could not find their daughters. And one week later, the Nigerian government still had not acknowledged the kidnapping. I choked back tears. I could not believe what I had just heard. I searched my phone for news, but there was nothing. How could this be? How could 276 Nigerian schoolgirls be abducted and the Nigerian government not rescue them and the entire world not rise up to help? These were innocent girls. I was horrified. I was enraged. I decided I had to go to Nigeria and try to help. So I looked for a fixer and to help me get into Borno, and I reserved a plane ticket. But then my children heard my plan, and they began to cry, and they begged me not to go. And it felt impossible. What could I do? I was only one person. How could I help the Chabot girls? I felt powerless to make a difference. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking, what would I do if my own children were kidnapped? The parents were searching for their girls without any apparent support. And in the US, no one was talking about this story. I sat up and I thought, if I can get the US media to pay attention, then maybe the Nigerian government would be forced to rescue the girls. I went on Twitter and I found a dozen tweets from Nigerians begging their government to rescue the girls. They ended each one with a hashtag, bring back our daughters, or bring back our girls. There was direct calls to action from Mrs. Obi Eswazeli, the former education minister. She was asking people to spread the news. So I sat down and I wrote my own messages, and I ended with that hashtag, bring back our girls. And I wrote to President Obama, Michelle Obama, the White House, Beyonce, Oprah, Ellen DeGeneres. I then went on Facebook and I started a Facebook page called Bring Back as Our Girls as a way for people to come together and find information. I asked all of my friends to join, and I asked them to change their profile pic to a red mnemonic that said Bring Back Our Girls as a way to march on social media to raise awareness. People started to respond. Within two days, 10,000 people had joined the Facebook page. In Abuja, the advocates were meeting daily to march and to protest. So in LA, I stood on Wilshire Boulevard in front of the federal building with my daughter and a couple friends. We held up Bring Back Our Girls signs. At first, our group was small, but then more people came, and soon we were marching across Los Angeles and holding rallies. On the fifth day of my advocacy, I received a call from the BBC World. They wanted to interview me. They wanted to know why an American woman cared about the Nigerian girls. My answer was simple, because I'm human. I sat at my kitchen table and I told them, I care because education of girls represents the most powerful antidote against terrorism. When you educate a girl, she's more likely to marry later in life and to educate her own children and to break the cycle of poverty. These 276 Nigerian girls were very close to graduating high school. They were precious to their families, and they were precious to their societies. Soon after, I received calls from CBS, NBC, and ABC, all wanting to speak with me. Within an hour, I found myself sitting in a small booth with a camera pointed at me, a microphone on my shirt, and an earpiece in my ear, and I was about to do my first live interview ever on CNN World. 
The reporter introduced me and then began firing off rapid questions. That interview was a blur. I just remember begging people to help. The truth was I really didn't know why the media was calling me to speak to me. I just was so relieved that they were finally telling the story that I agreed to speak to them. Two amazing things happened after those interviews. One, the major news outlets began reporting on the kidnapping. People across the globe began tweeting, taking photographs of themselves, holding up the Bring Back Our Girls sign, and attending marches. Students wrote their government, and thousands rallied. The Facebook page now had over 100,000 followers, and we were a central platform for people to organize, share information from Sweden to Peru. And two, John Kerry publicly offered US help, and the UK followed. I was absolutely sure that the Nigerian government would rescue the Chabot girls. But at the end of the week, Boko Haram released a video confirming they had the girls and that they were going to sell them and they had forced them into marriage. It was horrific. I was receiving emails telling me to stop speaking out. I was sent a video on Facebook of a girl being buried up to her neck and then stoned to death in a Boko Haram village. And then I received that call that threatened my life. We know where you live. We will shoot you at your next march. There are no kidnapped girls. You are a liar. And then the Wall Street Journal released a story about me, claiming that I wasn't actually a mother who cared, but rather I was a social media savvy expert who had inserted herself into this hashtag driven cause as a way to promote my film directing career. I was sick to my stomach. My husband went online and found a dozen articles that had picked up this erroneous news, and it was now considered quotable fact on the webosphere. On Twitter, I was receiving hundreds of tweets an hour from miscellaneous Twitter trolls who said I had no right to advocate for this cause, that I had hijacked the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag and not credited the Nigerian advocates. And still many more accused me of inventing the kidnapping as a political move to take down the Nigerian government. It was out of control. The bad news was relentless. The cyberbullying and misinformation against me was rampant. In my heartfelt passion to help the girls, I had done public interviews, unwittingly allowing the US media to make me a face of the movement that was in Nigeria. This was not my intention, but it was my mistake. I issued a public correction. I credited the Nigerian advocates, but it did little to stem the backlash, which was now rampant. The question I now had to answer was, would I give in to the cyberbullying and the death threats and stop? I called Ibrahim Abduhali, the Nigerian who had first tweeted the hashtag bring back our girls. I wrote to Obi Azwazeli, the leader of the movement. I spoke with Nigerian advocates in Abuja and the United States. R. Ivani Dehosa, a Nigerian lawyer based in New York, spoke to me really sternly and said, this isn't about you. Not one of us who's been an outspoken member of this group has not received cyberbullying. This is what happens when you stop being a spectator to an injustice and you stand up. I decided to continue to stand up because the schoolgirls needed my voice and the Nigerian activists asked me to help. I decided to continue to stand up because I needed to set a good example for my children. And I decided to speak out because you don't need to be from a country to care about people of that country. You don't need to be Nigerian to care about 276 Nigerian schoolgirls. You don't need to be Syrian to care about Syrian refugees. You don't need to be black to care about Black Lives Matter. You don't need to be Native American to care about Native American rights. People often ask me, 
if I consider this hashtag campaign a success. Success would be that the girls were home and safe. Success would be bringing back our girls. Social media was effective in getting this message out. This story would have likely stayed in Nigeria if it hadn't been for those tweets that Obi and Ibrahim and the other advocates first sent out. The fact that 276 Nigerian schoolgirls and their kidnapping became worldwide news and millions acted on this call to bring back our girls is a measure of its efficacy, but not its success. A hashtag has the power to get a message out to a vast community. It can work like an SOS to the world. It also has the power for people to then locate you and pummel you anonymously. But a hashtag has no real power. People have power. People must stand up and take action. Two and a half years have gone by since I first tweeted and since that call that threatened my life. 197 schoolgirls are still in the clutches of Boko Haram. 21 were rescued, one escaped, but 197 schoolgirls are still not safe. Every day, I work on behalf of these kidnapped girls. I run the Facebook page, and I organize rallies and marches, and I assisted in helping seven of the Chabot girls who originally escaped come to the United States and attend schools. What did this experience teach me? When you see an injustice, you stand up. When you see a person in need, you offer help. Together, we must change the world. Oppression can only exist in the dark, where people are unafraid or too afraid or unable to speak out. What I learned is that there is power in one voice, because one voice can speak out via social media and become a million voices. As a few of us socialize this message that the Nigerian schoolgirls matter, that people all over the world who are suffering matter, oppression becomes more difficult. And what if we all stand up? Well then, oppression and violence becomes impossible. Thank you. <laughs>